Good evening, everybody. And um, we will get started in just a second. If you would like to listen to the, tonight's session in Spanish, please select the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and select Spanish as your audio uh, option. Um, and we will get started in just a minute. Okay, again, good evening, everybody, and um, thank you for joining us for the Family Tech Talk Virtual Edition. My name is Lynette Owens, and I am the founder and global director of Trend Micro's Internet Safety for Kids and Families program. I am dialing in from the Boston area, so it's a little bit later here than where many of you are from. Again, if you would like to listen to tonight's session in Spanish, please select the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and pick Spanish as your audio selection. I'd like to also um, thank Gigi Margarita, who is our um, interpreter for Spanish this evening. So thank you so much for joining us. And um, before we begin, I also want to encourage you at any time during the evening to submit your questions using the Q&A option. Um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A option. And we will stop for questions throughout. There will be many opportunities for questions. And I know that they will come up uh, as we proceed. Um, at the end of the session tonight, I do encourage you to complete our survey, um, which you will see once you um, exit the Zoom session, it should launch a survey for you to complete. Very, very short, but we would appreciate your feedback uh, about tonight. So welcome to everybody that's on this line right now. Um, I believe we have 11 schools here <clears throat> represented in our audience tonight. Um, to the right of your school's name, you will see a column with numbers. And if your school um, or your PTO or PTA president uh, requires you to uh, have this code, um, this is an attendance code for you to um, submit um, uh, letting them know that you attended tonight's session. So please remember the code for your schools. And I can bring this uh, slide back up at the end if you forget, but go ahead and write down your school's code right now in case you need it to report your attendance for tonight's event. Okay. So I'd like to get to know you a little bit, um, and then I'll share a little bit about myself as you answer these questions. So please participate in the polls. And the first question I would like to know is, how old is your oldest child? Are they five years old or younger, six to 10 years old, 11 to 14, or 15 years or older? Please use the polling uh, selection to let me know so I have an idea of you. I have two kids, mine are 17 and 14, so um, a little bit older than some of yours. But uh, it's been an interesting several years to raise uh, teenagers through when it comes to technology. So again, please, uh, just a couple more seconds, please use the poll to answer the question, how old is your oldest child? And also, if you've already um, answered the question, um, Put in the chat, I'm gonna end the polling. Um, put in the chat, let me know where you're dialing in from. Say hello from wherever you are, whatever state, city, or school you're dialing in from. I'd love to hear you, from you in the chat. Say hello to each other. 
And I'm sharing the results here. It looks like most of you, your eldest child is between six and 10 years old. So that is a really fun age. I'm sure over the past year that your six to 10 year olds were using screens more than you maybe had planned <laughs> during this period of time. And that's okay. We will talk about what that means. Another group, big group of you have the 11 to 14 year olds, um, which is a whole different other phase of life when it comes to technology. So we have something for everyone in terms of our discussion tonight. So um, not to worry. All right, another question. And hello, um, thank you for putting in the chat where you're dialing in from. So we've got lots of California, we've got Wyoming. Um, fantastic, welcome. And again, if you want to listen in Spanish, please select the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and choose Spanish as your audio. The second question I have for you is how are your children actually um, attending school? Are they going remote still? Are they hybrid or are they fully in person now? And I realize it may have been different at the beginning of the year, but how are they going to school now? Remote, hybrid, or in person, A, B, or C. And um, my kids actually started out as hybrid in September, last September, and they've just begun going back full time every day in person. The day is a little bit shorter, but it's still a change for them. So, well, great. It looks like most of you are still are, are in a hybrid situation. Um, and actually that mirrors a national survey that's been done um, since October, I'm sorry, since last August, um, that has shown that the majority of schools across America actually were going in a hybrid model. And um, that pretty much still is the case even up to today. So um, that's great. Thank you for sharing that information with me. Um, it gets, gives me a chance to understand where you're coming from and what your experience has been over this past year in particular. So before we get started, you know, I think a lot has changed over the last year. And there was a study done very recently by the Digital Wellness Lab that has shown technology ended up providing a lot of benefits, some of which we knew would be the case and some of which surprised us for our children. Everything from supporting their learning to keeping them socially connected to others. Um, but it also created a lot of challenges, um, particularly when it came to issues of screen time or what your child was allowed to use and when they were allowed to use it. So that probably resonates with many of you. Um, and while a lot of things changed over the past year, there are things that did not change. You know, the first is that our children do still need our guidance because the risks to them of you know, being exposed to content or to people that may not be okay for them at their age yet, uh, we're still there. Risks of uh, overuse, risks of potentially bullying um, and other negative consequences. But the benefits also were always there and they remain there as well. So we're going to talk about both of those things tonight. And that is why teaching our children to be good digital citizens is more important than ever. And when we talk about digital citizenship, what we mean is four things. The first is we do wanna talk about the risks. How do we help our children identify risks and avoid them? But we also wanna talk about literacy, which is, okay, if I know that something is a risk, what are the things I can do to avoid them? Such as privacy, I need to protect my privacy. So where are the privacy settings and how do I actually use them? Or, or I need to find information that is credible for a paper that I'm working on. 
where do I go for the most credible sources? So digital literacy is an important part of digital citizenship. The way we behave and the rules that govern that expected behavior is also important in digital citizenship. Um, how do I treat others? But also, how do I behave in ways that are beneficial for me and for the communities that I'm engaging with online? The last part of digital citizenship is the one that often gets forgotten, often gets forgotten. And that part is very often when we talk to children about technology use, it's, it's usually a really long list of what not to do. But we have to also remember to encourage and to model the ways in which our children should be using technology. It's not just about what not to do. It's also about what they should be doing with technology to benefit themselves, to benefit others, and to benefit the world around them. We've got to balance our messages and our guidance and the examples we set with both of those sides of the equation. So we like to break this down into four parts. You know, first, being online um, is important and it rests on us as parents and caregivers to make sure that we're setting it up in a way that helps our children be safe, be kind, and be savvy while they are there. Now, specifically on being online, what we want to talk about is how do we set up the right environment, the rules, and the example for them. So, um, and under safety, we talk about how to protect your privacy, your information, and your personal physical selves. On being kind, we do often talk about how you treat other people. But as we'll talk about later on, especially as your 11 to 14 year old children become introduced to the world of social media and connecting with others and developing relationships there, that kindness needs to be directed inward as well. Finally, on being savvy, how do we encourage the good habits and the good uses? This is all around the issue of mastery. So in setting up the right environment, um, this is really about the physical space. So first to begin, and some of this you've probably been already doing for the past year. Um, so I won't go through this in great detail, um, but certainly even if they're going back to school full time or in a hybrid model, or certainly in the coming year, hopefully in the fall when they return and they are able to go back full time, they're still gonna be using technology at home. This is an uh, inescapable reality now for our for students. So um, whenever they are online, making sure their physical um, health is supported, um, doing everything from you know having a space where it's quiet, you know, investing in headphones if they need that to focus. Um, I'm a big fan of taking care of the eyes. So if you haven't heard of the 30-30-30 rule before, this is a, a, something you can teach your children even at a young age, that every 30 minutes you can set a timer or something. Have them look up from the screen and look out the window for 30 feet away for 30 seconds. And just by doing this exercise, it's um, good, better for the eyes. I have over the past year been told by families that they've bought blue light glasses. And these are inexpensive. You can get them on Amazon in packs of four, five, or six. Uh, they don't require a prescription. Um, they literally filter the blue light coming off of the screens and preventing it from damaging the back of the eyes, which over time can be pretty uh, harmful. So this is something even we as adults should practice. I have my pair of blue lights. I'm not wearing them tonight, but um, I do have them when I'm you know, working on something. Um, pretty intensely. Um, and then, you know, posture and just getting up and moving and making sure that, you know, just hunched over a laptop is not something they're doing for too long of a time. The other part about the environment is the technology. 
So um, how do you make sure that the network that everybody might be using in your house is running in a way that's not unproductive for people? So the first thing is if you've got a router, maybe you've got a new one over the past year, or maybe you've had one for a long time. Very often when you get the router, it comes with a password. And very often people never change that password. So if that's something you haven't done in a while, I recommend you do it and you do it with some frequency. Yeah, uh, in case for some reason, someone gives out that password and um, gives it to other people, someone sitting right outside your house the, who has the password could actually get onto your network. And that's not something you want to necessarily allow the whole public to do for many reasons, um, which are related to this next point. Your router might actually give you the ability to split the network, okay? You can have a main part of the network and a guest network. Now, every router is going to be different depending on your brand. And you can search for this online pretty easily for your brand to say, how do I create a guest network on my, uh, on my home um, Wi-Fi? What you'd want to do is set up that second network for guests and put your children's devices on that. And the more sensitive devices in your home, maybe it's your work laptop or uh, a desktop that has all your family photos on it or something, on the main network. The reason for this is if someone were to hack into your children's devices, because you know sometimes our children accidentally click on something and they've downloaded you know, a virus of some kind, that it would only uh, put at risk the devices on that network and not the network where your, uh, where your uh, important stuff is on. So that the idea of splitting your network, putting your kids stuff on a guest network is a really good practice. Um, and something, again, depending on your brand, you look up online to see if how you can do this. Wi-Fi extenders are an investment, but if people need to be separated in the house, this makes sure that the Wi-Fi connection is as strong in this part of the house as it is in a different part of your house. So that's something also to consider so that the Wi-Fi strength is strong everywhere. And finally, you know, again, some of you are, you, your children are still remote or on the, they're hybrid. So sometimes they're at home and you're trying to work at home, have conversations at the beginning of the day. When do you need to be on? When do you need to be on? That way you're hopefully not all on the network at the same time and creating what the kids like to say, lag. You know, why is my connection so laggy? Um, it's very frustrating, as you know, for anyone that that happens to when you're in the middle of doing something. On security, this is also an important um, element of setting up the environment <clears throat> because um, your children are on the same network as you now because they're home a lot more. So they could be putting things at risk if they accidentally click on something or tap on something on their iPad. So the first thing you wanna do is make sure security software is on every device that connects to the internet. That means laptops, iPads, and phones. If you go to uh, search for um, top security software options, you will find many great um, products out there. Some of them may already be installed on your laptop and just make sure you're keeping them updated um, because if you don't, you're not getting the latest security. So make sure you have that and everything. And inside the security software, there's a setting called a firewall. And the firewall basically watches traffic coming in and out of your device. And it's, it's like a bouncer. It says, what's okay, like, like security guards saying, what is okay to come in or not? Um, so make sure that that setting is turned on. Strong passwords is a great um, security habit and practice. And I'll show you in a second, something you can do with your kids to teach them how to practice good password skills using multi-factor authentication. What is that? <laughs> well, in Facebook and in Instagram, and I think also in Roblox, it's called two-step verification. 
Sometimes it's called two-factor authentication. It's all the same thing. It's basically turning on another lock. So the password could be the first lock to get into your account. And then the second step is, is this multi-factor authentication step. A lot of times it's, if you have this turned on in Facebook, for example, you log into Facebook, you enter your password, and then it's going to text a code to your phone. Well, when you turned on that setting, you had to give Facebook a, a phone number, and that's how it knows to send you that text. That second code is the second step. The reason that's important, and not every app that your kid uses has this available, but most of the popular ones do. And that is, if someone were to steal your password, they still won't be able to get into the account because they won't be able to, to do the next step. That next step requires that they either also have your phone that where the code would be texted to, or sometimes it's emailed to you. So they would also have to have your email address and all of the login information for that too. So please turn on two-factor in any app or game that you or your children are using, okay? And finally, using a virtual private network. This only matters if you're not connecting from home. Like if you're out at a Starbucks or in an airport, maybe you're not traveling so much right now, but you know, when you go back to that time and you're using a Wi-Fi publicly, you should never just connect to that without any kind of protection. Make sure you're using a virtual private network because that enable that makes sure that the information traveling from your device or your children's device in route to whatever app or site it's going to is also protected and that no one can interrupt the flow of that and steal it. That's why. Now to look up a virtual private network, again, just like security software, just do a search on the best virtual private networks out there. And there are many great options. So um, one thing that I can't stress enough is to update the apps on your devices as often as you can. Do it at night, make it a habit to just update all apps. Um, and the reason that's important is especially during the pandemic, we know that a lot of uh, cyber criminals were quite active because they knew so many of us were on the internet for longer periods of time. And these updates, are apps who are discovering sometimes security vulnerabilities in those games and those apps. So if you don't update, then you're putting yourself and your children are also putting your, your family at risk if those things are not updated. So update it as often as you can. And the strong password skill that I recommend is, first of all, the longer the password, the stronger it is. Yes, it's important to throw in a special character it makes it a little harder if you do, but the longer it is, the stronger it is. Unfortunately, a lot of sites don't allow a password to go on forever. So one way that you could create a great password with your kids is to come up with a sentence and to use the first letter of each word in the sentence as your password. So they could come up with fun sentences like, you know, I love playing Roblox every day or, you know, my mom or dad is the greatest ever or something like that. <laughs> but but work with them, throw in an extra character, a special character, like an exclamation point to just give it that extra strength and then change them often. And this is a it's never too early to start this skill with children. It's one of the most important things they can practice at a young age. Finally, backing up and storing your back your your backup. Um, use Apple iCloud. Use Google Cloud. Use any number of backup services that are off online. But I also recommend, if you can if you can swing it, to also buy the the hard drive backup in addition to using those cloud services. And the reason is if one of those two was ever compromised, let's say you actually broke the hard drive one, you would still have the cloud backup. Or maybe the cloud one gets hacked for some reason, you still have the hard drive one. So if you can swing it, I would 
recommend doing both. Again, I'm going to be going through a lot of information tonight. So if questions come up, please don't hesitate to enter them in the Q&A because I will be pausing to answer them as, as they come up. So um, great. Now I want to talk quickly about tech tools and this is probably the one where I get a lot of questions every time. There's tech tools already available to you that you don't pay, you don't even have to pay for. They're already there. They, they're sitting inside the devices you own, the apps that your kids are using, and even on the app stores. So what do these tools do? They can help you limit the kinds of content your kids are seeing, limit the amount of money they're spending within an app, let's say like a game or social network. They can help you limit the amount of time they're actually on it. And some of them even allow you to just see what they're doing when they're using the devices or the apps. So I'm gonna show you some examples in a second. The first one is iOS screen time. So go ahead and put in the chat if you are familiar with iOS screen time. If you're an Apple user or your kids use iPads, you're probably somewhat familiar with this because this is that, this is that setting that every Sunday morning sends you this lovely message saying, you used your phone 16% more this week than the previous week. So it's always so great at making you feel guilty. But this is the same setting. And if you're not already aware of it, um, you find it under settings, you select screen time. And towards the bottom, if you have set your children up with I, uh, iTunes accounts under yours, you will see their names here. And when you select one of them, you're able to do a number of things uh, here. And one of the things that you're able to do is actually um, do some of that management that we talked about. So um, you can prevent apps that are over a certain age from being downloaded onto the device. You can see how much time they're actually spending on games versus social media versus websites and so on. And you can even set time limits on specific apps. So, um, you know, I, I recommend you check it out if you're not familiar with it already. Um, and use this is one way to actually use a tool that's free to you. If you're an Apple family, um, definitely have a look at iOS screen time. Anybody's children using TikTok out there? Let me know on the chat. Are they using TikTok? Are they begging you to get TikTok? Are you saying no, but probably at some point? Okay, I know everyone has a love-hate relationship with TikTok because they just don't know. <laughs> but let me tell you this. In April of last year, TikTok introduced something called family pairing. And this is a wonderful way for you parents who are not ready yet to let your child have the full TikTok experience yet, or you think your child's not ready to have the full TikTok experience yet. And what family pairing actually does is it allows you to designate one of the devices as the parent device and the other device as the child's device. Both have to download TikTok, but you as the, from the parent device can decide what kinds of content, you can filter content that's not gonna be okay for their young eyes. You can limit who can actually connect with them. And you can also limit the amount of time they're actually there. So you're seeing some screenshots here. Um, you will find TikTok family pairing under a setting called digital well-being. Digital well-being, you select family pairing, you would turn it on. And if you first download it on your phone, you're gonna say, this is the parent, this is the parent device. And then for the other device, you'll designate that as the child's device. Once you're in there as the parent device, here's where you can set the time limits, the kind of content that they can see and who's actually allowed to connect with your children. I have tested this and you know, none of, none of these settings are 100% perfect, but I will say for the most part, um, you're, they're only going to see animals and, you know, pretty 
innocuous content, content that's not so harmful. So um, this is, uh, I highly recommend for those who are wondering, should I let them have TikTok? It's a wonderful way to ease yourself into that. And you know what? If you're not okay with it, even after doing family pairing, you know, just say, you know, we need to wait a little bit longer. Um, but this is a way that you could do that. Oh, by the way, TikTok decided that anyone under the age of 16 um, would have their privacy settings automatically set to private. The other, the other app that just decided recently to do the same is Snapchat. Um, that was not the case before. All of these apps, everything else, privacy is not on by default. You need to go in there and do all of that checking. Okay. Anybody's kids like Roblox? I'm sure there's a few of you <laughs> who have kids. Let me know in the chat, Roblox. For those of you not familiar, and you know, even I wasn't quite sure, Roblox is not a single game. Roblox is a community of and a platform of many games. And some of those games are actually created by other Roblox people or their kids. Many of them are kids too. Maybe some of your kids are creating their games on Roblox. Um, but pair, pretty and pretty harmless. Um, but the thing about Roblox is everyone thinks that only young children are using it. It's not true. There's quite a few older teenagers and adults playing Roblox as well. So it's very important to make sure you have turned on the settings uh, in Roblox. And I'm going to show you a quick video here of how you can do that. You'll see that Roblox has a, um, a sorry, a setting that is their uh, multi-factor authentication setting. And um, Let's see here, just play this for a minute. You would go first go to uh, the security settings and you enter a code. You see two-step verification there, by the way. And this code would only be known by you as the parent. So <clears throat> once that is on, now you can go in and do all kinds of things. And the privacy settings now, which again, anytime you change something, it requires that code to change anything. You can decide who that can chat with them, who can join them in games, and so on. So if you've not already done that for your children's Roblox, I recommend you do this. One other thing you should know about Roblox, they're very, very good at monitoring the chats. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with Roblox, but maybe your kids are going to use it someday, there's a lot of chatting. And their chatting is free form. Okay. They can say whatever to other players. Uh, and they're, they're just playing as a video game avatar, right? Roblox is heavily monitoring with people the messaging that's going on. And if someone tries to ask for a home address or a phone number and the child might be tempted to enter that address, it will not go up. Roblox um, moderators are watching for this all the time. So just know that you, you've got some good people there working. There's a, it's a great team actually at Roblox trying to keep children safe, but do the step of using these settings as well um, because it's still important for you as a parent to be involved and not just leave it all to the Roblox moderators. Okay, anybody out there is kids using Androids or, um, like the Samsung phones, they don't have an iPhone, let's say they have a Samsung phone. Just put it in the chat if you are. If you're using um, Samsung phones or your children have those, um, uh, or they even like to use YouTube or you know Google search anywhere on any device, Google actually has their answer to, I, uh, to iOS screen time. Their app is called Google Family Link, it's free. As well. By the way, all these things are free that I've been showing you. Google Family Link is an app that you can download um, from the um, Google Play Store. And you can set up all your family under it and you can limit many things uh, and monitor many things, um, including the um, kinds of uh, apps they're allowed to download. 
because as you know, apps all have ages associated with them. So you can filter the kinds of apps they're allowed to download. Within Google Family Link, you can also limit screen time on those apps. Um, if they're using a mobile device like Samsung or other phone using the Android operating system, you can track their location and so on. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize though is that Google owns one of the most favorite apps of all children, YouTube. So your options today with YouTube are either they can watch YouTube like any adult and see everything, or you can download an app called YouTube Kids and see basically Elmo <laughs> and content that's like that age, very young. So what do you do for the kids that aren't ready to be out on YouTube like adults or um, not ready really to be, uh, or, or too old for Elmo, right? So that's between, you know, my kids were probably nine, 10 years old and they were already done with Sesame Street, but they were not ready yet for a full YouTube. Just last month, YouTube announced it's in beta right now. It's called the YouTube supervised account. And this is hallelujah, the answer to all of our challenges with YouTube. So once it becomes available, I'm going to show you at the end of tonight, my contact information, because I plan on blasting about it on my um, social media to let you know once it's available. But this will give you the options for kids between the ages of you know, nine and 11, 12 and 14 and 15 to 17. They're calling it explore, explore more and most of YouTube. But this is basically for that age group of kids who we've all probably been struggling with for a while saying, I just don't know when they watch a video, I don't know what's coming next. So these settings that YouTube is working on will allow for this. And once this is ready, if you're using Google Family Link, you will be able to set these settings for your children through the Google Family Link. If you don't use Google Family Link, you'll still be able to set YouTube these settings on whatever device your child is using just within YouTube. Um, but just know that's coming, it's not available yet. I know there was a question here, can I go back to the setting on Roblox? Um, yes, Martha, I'm gonna do that right just for you, just for a second here. Um, so if you go under settings and you select security, okay, settings, you pick security, then you're gonna enter a four digit code. And after you've done that, you go back into the settings and anything you want to do to protect their privacy, anytime you change any setting requires that code, only you'll be able to change it and you can limit who can contact them and who can play games with them and so on. So I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Okay. Great. Um, you're welcome. So in setting the rules, uh, there's a few things I, I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly, but I am gonna focus on one part with a little bit of time. As you set the rules about apps or devices with your kids, you know, we you typically think about five areas. What are they allowed to use? When are they allowed to use it and for how long? Where are they allowed to use it? Meaning in your home only or at a, only certain friends' houses or so on? And with whom are they allowed to use it? And in terms of what they're allowed to use, you know, a lot of times this begins with the question when the child says to you, mom, dad, can I please get this game? Can I please download this app? And that's a perfect time for you to have a conversation. Any moment that you can have a conversation with your kids when it comes to technology is a great thing. So if it's something you have not heard of before, certainly do your homework, do some research, if it's an app that doesn't have a lot of reviews yet, I would highly recommend staying away from it, especially if it's hard to find out about how they protect its users and their privacy. Um, I'm a big fan of Common Sense Media. Common Sense Media gives you great third-party reviews 
of apps, games, websites, and by the way, even movies. If you were ever stuck in a situation where you had kids of multiple ages and they cannot agree on a movie that you want to see, go to Common Sense Media and they'll give you some great suggestions because I don't know how many nights every weekend we go through that, but yes, Common Sense Media. Now, I'm gonna skip over when and how long in a little bit, because I'm gonna go through an exercise with you on how to help your children think about screen time, okay? Where and with whom, you know, very simply, that's, um, again, where in the house or where outside the house they're allowed to use screens. And, you know, this rule about where is important after the pandemic, because I often get asked about rules that are different between families. So for example, your child, you don't allow them to play first person shooter games yet on their Xbox, but perhaps a different child is allowed to do that. And by the way, this happens with PG-13 movies and, and so on. It's the same kind of you know, differences between families and our values. It's I highly recommend you be very forthcoming about what your rules are in your house before your child goes to someone else's house to use their devices. And that way that family knows, right? And it doesn't make for anything awkward <laughs> later on. Um, with whom can they use it? The younger they are, you should keep that in a closed circle. And as they get older and they show you that they can be trusted, you can expand with whom they're allowed to connect with on social media or play online games with. And every time you think about rules, if there's anything you can do to involve your children in the development of the rules, they're more apt to stick to the rules they help to build. Not always, but um, if they have siblings, have them involved as well. And have them also think about what the consequences if they break their own rules, if they break the rules you agree on, what are the consequences going to be? Siblings are so good at holding each other accountable for those rules. They're just a built in um, monitoring each other. <laughs> so involve the siblings whenever you can. Now let's talk about screen time because it definitely was one of the biggest issues it was before the pandemic, but it certainly was exacerbated. So I wanna talk about a way to think about screen time that you can talk to your children about. And I think this applies whether there is a pandemic or not. And this exercise is called the 24 hour exercise. And it comes from the um, Digital Wellness Lab, formerly known as the Center for Media and Child Health out of um, Children's Hospital, Boston and Harvard uh, Medical. And this is how it goes. You need to talk to your kids and make them aware that a single day only has 24 hours. And there's a lot of things we do in that time. So have them write down in a list if they're able, if they're old enough, or just talk to them about it and ask them these questions or help them answer these questions. How many hours today did we spend, did you spend to do the things that are important for your physical health? How many hours did you sleep, eat or help prepare meals, be outside, exercise, ride your bike, go for a walk, you know, collect bugs, <laughs> do something, plant, plant flowers. So how many hours was that? On top of that, how many hours did you spend to support yourself as a learner? So how many hours were you in school? Did you do homework? Maybe you spent time reading or practicing a hobby like an instrument or you, know, you like to build things um, or some other kind of skill, okay? How many hours? On top of that, how many hours in a day did you spend to support the relationships that are important in your life? So time with family, with friends, neighbors, maybe distant family, even if it was over 
doing a Zoom chat that's still supporting relationships in your life, right? How many hours? Now you add all those hours up and there's going to be time left. Or maybe there isn't going to be time left, but maybe there's time left over. Well, that's okay then if some of that time is used for screens because they have thought about and they have done all of those things that are really important for them in many different ways. Now, what they can do with that time left over, what you can do as their parents is to maybe create a list of options that they can choose from to use that leftover time. Um, some people actually have children write ideas on slips of paper, fold them up, put them in a box or a jar, and they pick from it. Some of those ideas could be screen time. Some of them might not. Um, that's up to you as a family. Now, if the time left over is four, five, six, seven hours, it does not mean that they spend on screens for four, five, six, or seven hours. That's where your rules and the tools that we talked about can help you manage that screen time. But I do think stepping back and talking holistically about a child with your children about their day and all of the things they need to do that are really good and healthy for them is a great way to think about where screen time might fit within that context. Okay, in terms of setting the example, I think this is pretty self-explanatory, but you know, these are questions you should ask yourself. What do you do, especially if let's say you're working from home, what do you do to separate work time from home time? You can put it in the chat. Do you have any rules for yourself? Do you charge your phone next to your bed at night? Or do you put it in another part of the house? Um, do you have the phone at the dinner table and are you looking at it during meals? And do you expect your children to do the same or differently than what you're doing? These are questions we have to ask ourselves because it's going to be very difficult to expect of our children the things we're not doing ourselves. They will follow us, follow whatever it is we are doing. Um, great, and we have a question when we are doing bingo. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so moving on to being safe. Let's talk about privacy first, okay? I think, as I said previously, most apps and games and devices don't have privacy settings on by default as soon as you buy them. So make sure you turn those on um, every time you download a new app or game or so on. But here's the thing about privacy, okay? And this is a good conversation to have with your children, by the way. You know, very often, we're telling kids, you know, don't post that, don't do that because someone might see it and it just could be really bad for you, right? And, you know, I've been in classrooms and I've taught this stuff to kids and, you know, they, they're pretty skeptical uh, or they just don't wanna be lectured at or if you keep telling them don't do this and don't do that, it's like a forbidden fruit and they just wanna do it because you told them not to. <laughs> But here's the reality, okay? And I'm just showing you, by the way, these are just screenshots of Fortnite, another really popular game among kids. And the fact that their privacy settings are not on by default, so get in there and turn them on if they're, if they're not already on. But the thing is, every time we download a new app, every time we um, download a new game, there's all this legal language that we never read because it's too long. And sometimes it's really hard to understand. But in almost every free app, there's a clause in there that is written in legal language, but this is what it means in very simple language. You own everything you're doing on here. Everything you post, anything you click on, anything anyone you're connecting to, all the things, all the behaviors, it, you own that. But you give us the right to use that information 
whenever, wherever, forever. That is the price of free. So when we tell our children, yes, use privacy settings, because that will protect you from the people you don't know out there from seeing what they're doing. The privacy settings do absolutely nothing to create privacy between you and the company who made that app. For this reason, this legal language that we don't read, we skip right through and we hit I accept, and we don't pay to use these apps with money, but we're paying with something else. That's why when we tell our kids that nothing you ever do online is truly private, this is exactly why. It's not because we're trying to just scare them into the behavior. This is the reason why. And um, when I have told children about the actual economics behind free apps, it actually gets them quite annoyed. And I had a fifth grader ask me once, can I sue Instagram? And I said, well, did you hit I accept? And she said, yes. And I said, then no, because you agreed to that. Um, on protecting our personal information, I think that there is, um, you know, very low likelihood that cyber criminals are trying to steal anything from your kids. They don't have money. They don't necessarily have, they don't have bank accounts necessarily. They might have bank accounts in their names, but not as much money as you. You, you would be a greater target for them. The problem is that cyber criminals are wherever the people are. So your children might actually have come across the work of these hackers. In fact, when I have pulled children in classrooms and asked them, have you ever seen a suspicious text or pop-up ad or something? Almost always they raise their hands and they can tell that there's something quite suspicious about this post or this offer or this website. So we should tell our children to trust those instincts that if something looks too good to be true, it definitely, probably, definitely is. And um, if, but I will say that if they accidentally click on something and they think they made a mistake, make sure the door is open, that they come to you about it so you can take action. Maybe they clicked on something that ends up downloading malicious software, you know, a virus or a spyware onto your system. And if, if they've done that, you know, there are free tools out there. One of them from my company, Trend, it's called Housecall, housecall.trendmicro.com. It does free scans of devices just to tell you if there's any viruses or anything on there that you should be worried about. But um, anyway, make sure they feel like they can come to you if they feel like they made a mistake. The other thing you can do is what we talked about in the beginning. Use security software on every device your children are using to connect to the internet because if they did click on something that actually is a malicious link, they would be blocked from doing that in the first place if you're using reputable security software on your devices. Um, I had a question here, are we gonna talk about Discord? Uh, I wasn't specifically going to talk about Discord, but um, I'm happy to maybe chat at it, about it at the end, or I'll give you my contact information. And if you have a specific question about it, I'd be more than happy to take it. Um, on email with you, happy to do that. Okay, I've got a poll here. Um, how many of you, well, do any of your children own their own cell phone right now? Yes, no, not yet, but soon and not for a few more years. So yes, no, not yet, but soon, and not for a few more years. Okay, um, a lot of you are saying no, and not for a few more years. For those of us who have children who are older, we know the answer is eventually Yes, <laughs> in all cases. So I see a lot of you are not at that point yet, and that's good, so I'm glad. For those of you whose children are already, who already have a cell phone, that's fine. We're gonna have a really important conversation about the, the phones, okay? 
specifically the one feature about the phone that kids love the most of all, the most of all, and that is the camera. Because the camera, uh, because a lot of the apps that they're using now that they love, like TikTok and social media, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, require that camera, okay? And I think kids should definitely have fun with it. Do, you know, they're great photographers. That's wonderful. Um, or take pictures of family, friends, your pets, you know, the outside, so on. I want to say a couple of things though about the camera. Number one, when you get a device for the first time and you take pictures with it and you post them somewhere, every photo you take is tagged with a lot of information you don't even see, okay? This is called metadata. One of those pieces of information is your location, the latitude and longitude of where the photo was taken. So if they're taking a lot of photos of themselves in their bedroom and they post that online and you have not done one thing that you can do to protect them, uh, then people can take the photo, do a, do a search, and they can find out exactly where you live, where their bedroom is. So what I recommend you do with their devices and your own is go into the location services and turn it off for the camera. Location services are on for so many of the apps on your phones, but unless you want that latitude and longitude attached to every photo you take, and post in the public. Um, turn off location services for the camera and do that for your children as well. You don't, I wouldn't turn off location services for other apps like Google Maps or um, Waze because you know the app needs to know where you are in order to give you directions of where to go. So don't turn it up for every app, but if you don't like your location attached to all of your photos, turn it off for the camera, okay? The second thing about the camera is when you're, for those of you whose children already have a phone, please have this conversation if you did not already have this conversation. And those of you who are thinking about getting your children a phone soon have this conversation. And that is, they should never ever feel pressured to take a photo of themselves, the kind of photo they would not want the whole world to see. Okay. I don't know if there's any children listening. Um, that's why I'm not actually using language other than what I'm saying now. But we need to encourage our children to never um, give in to any pressure to take those kinds of photos of themselves, even if it's just they think it's just because they it's one person they really like is asking for it. Unfortunately, over the course of the pandemic, there has been a rise in self-produced imagery and videos of young children in compromising positions that is making their way onto the internet and people who have less than honorable intentions getting a hold of these and um, either uh, blackmailing the children basically and saying, if you don't send me another one, I will blast it all over the world for your whole family and the world to see. Um, for children who might feel pressured to take one but never send it to anybody, even the act of taking it is putting them at risk because the production of, the distribution of, and the possession of imagery of young underage kids in that way is technically a felony. Now, whether or not they're gonna punish children the way they would somebody who's 50 years old is a different story. Um, but we need to encourage our kids not to even take them in the first place because if that device is being automatically backed up to the cloud, then already it doesn't belong safe on that device. It's already traveled to another place. So that's a second second point about the camera. The third is, I have to share this question with you because it was asked of me by a father probably seven years ago now, and I thought it was a great question that I'd like to share with other parents. And he said to me, 
my son is a really good kid. Um, and a lot of people like him. What if he ever receives one of those pictures from a classmate or somebody else? What should he do? And what should I do since I'm paying for the phone and the phone bill? And my advice is this, if that does ever happen to one of your kids, first of all, communication is key from the very beginning. If it happens to them, they should immediately tell you and delete the photo. Immediately take the action of telling you and then delete the photo. Now you as the parent, you as the parent can now take action. If you feel that it's, it's a child whose parent you know and you feel comfortable enough to let that parent know, please do that. If it's a child in their school or your town that you don't know, then I would raise it to the school administration because it's very possible, you don't know, that it was maybe sent to other people too. And the reason you wanna delete it is because you don't wanna be in possession of it. And if there is an investigation, they're already going to know where it came from, who it went to, and whether or not you still have it on your phone, right? Um, so don't walk around with it, but please encourage your children if they ever receive one to let you know immediately and tell them delete it, okay? All right. Um, on gaming, you know, I think the one thing about gaming is that almost every game now is social. We often think of social media as only, you know, Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok. It's not. Games have become a media that is social too. And uh, it's not like the days of Atari that I played Space Invaders. I couldn't really play it with someone else in another state. It was just me and my sibling sitting right next to me if they wanted. Um, so we need to be uh, very mindful of who we're allowing our children to game with. And there are settings in games that allow you to limit who they can game with. Xbox, for any families, any families out there have an Xbox, put it in the chat. They released in last September an app called the Xbox Family Settings app. It's free on Android and on Apple iTunes store. It allows you to do the settings of the Xbox from your phone. You don't actually have to go to the Xbox and do all those settings. You can do it right from your phone and you can decide, are they allowed to use the web browser on it or not? Are they allowed to play games that are greater than 10 plus? Are they allowed to do you know, this kind of chatting and so on? So I highly recommend downloading that free app. Um, all right, I'm being kind. I will say about this that um, very briefly that we want our kids to be nice. We want them to treat others with respect and kindness because it's the right thing to do. But for all the reasons we already talked about, nothing online is truly ever private. So it is a reflection of them. Every action they take, everything they click on, search for, um, comment they make, people they connect to, people they like, posts they like, all those digital actions add up to a picture of who they are. It's being tracked by somebody, by some company, everything we're doing. So make sure that we children are treating others with respect because it's the right thing to do, but online it is, creates a record of who they are. And when we talk about respect, we're not just talking about don't, don't make fun of people, don't call them names. We're also talking about things like their privacy. And I highly recommend for your kids who don't yet use social media heavily, when they do, when they become old enough to do that, and we should do this by the way as adults, if they take photos with friends their closest friends, they can just say, you know, anytime before I post this, I'm gonna say, you, are you okay? Are you okay if I post this? Have any of you ever had a family member or friend or neighbor post a photo with you or your kids in it, didn't ask you, and you weren't really psyched about it? Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. And, and I've had to have the awkward conversation with the other person of, 
please, you know, before you do that, can you please ask us next time? Yes, I see some of you are saying it has happened to you, right? Let's all make this pact with each other. We should make this a normal part of how we behave online. But that's what it means to respect another person's privacy. Um, or one of the ways that you can respect their privacy. Also, other kids are gonna have other rules than yours. So don't make fun of the kids that don't yet have a phone, okay? There are 10 year olds, 11 year olds who have phones and there are 10 year olds and 11 year olds who do not yet. These years are quite awkward. I know I've lived through them. And um, you just, if you choose not to give your child a phone yet till later, that's your decision and hold true to those values if you don't think your children are ready. For you who've given your children a phone at younger ages, that's also your decision. You know, I think we just need to respect each other's rules and teach each other, our children to do the same. Um, and if kids start creating text group chats that your child might be excluded from, we or, or vice versa, that your child is excluding another child because they don't have a phone yet, make sure that we're consciously telling our children, hey, so-and-so doesn't have a phone yet, make sure you tell them in person or email them or call them, okay? If you're gonna do this conversation because they don't have a phone yet. Finally, not every kid has time allowed to be on it, their screens at the same times. I had a mother come to me, gosh, four or five years ago, and she said her daughter texted a friend and the friend did not respond right away. In fact, she didn't even respond later that night, didn't even hear from her till the next day. Her daughter was distraught and thought that that friend was very upset with her. The reality was that that, friend was not allowed to use her phone after a certain hour. That's, that's all that it was. So we've got to remind our children, hey, there's no drama going on here sometimes. It's just that everybody has different rules. Maybe they should talk to their friends about, you know, I'm not allowed to use mine after this hour and avoid the drama in the first place. So when our kids start using social media, it can get really caught up in looking at someone else's feed and saying, oh my gosh, look at their pandemic life. It seems like theirs is more glamorous than mine. Has that ever happened to you? You look on Facebook or Instagram, it seems like everybody's life's better than yours. Well, children who are new to this need to be reminded that, that they are not equal to them. Some of their likes, followers, friends on Instagram or Snapchat. They are not, they are worth so much more than that. We've got to remind our children that their value should not be equal to what's going on in social media. Um, so how do we nurture kindness? We've got to be supportive of them. Um, be open for conversations. If your child seems like they're a little off, you know, maybe something did happen online. Maybe someone said something unkind to them. Be in tune with that and have those conversations regularly. And one thing you can do to be prepared is ask yourself two questions. Write down the answers, put it away, and hopefully you'll never have to pull out that piece of paper. Those two questions are, what would you do if your child was ever a recipient of hate, unkindness, or bullying online? What would you do if that happened to them? The other question is, what would you do if it was your child that was being unkind towards another person? Most children from all of the research shows, they're not going to be engaging in this behavior, but a lot of them will become witnesses. They will be bystanders. They may see this happening among other kids. So the other final thing we can do is to teach them how to be a good upstander. You know, support the person who's being victimized by, you know, telling them, hey, don't listen to that person. You're you're a great person. They're just, I don't know what's what's up with them, but don't listen to them. Or, you know, going to an adult like you to say something's going on, someone that they trust who can intervene, taking action. But we do know that children who witness bullying and unkindness online as, as witnesses only do experience a kind of 
uh, I wouldn't say trauma necessarily, but they, they feel it too when they see it happening. So giving our children tools to take action as a bystander is good for them. It's also good for the person who's being harmed. And it creates a culture of their school or their community that says, this is not a place. This is not a place where hate and unkindness are allowed to thrive. I will close with being savvy. These are about, you know, teaching good habits and good skills. So um, it's very, very easy, as we know, to fool other people on the internet. Um, so when I ask kids this question, how do you know if that person's account is actually a real person or is actually the person that they say they are? So believe it or not, your children, children, our children are very, very astute. They know now to do what's called a reverse image search. Okay. If you go to images on Google or just look up reverse image search on your favorite search engine, you can plop a photo into there and it'll show you where that photo has existed previously. So if you're looking at someone's account, you're like, I don't know if this is a real person or not take that person's photo and do a re reverse image search. And you can see if it's ever been used somewhere else or by someone else before. Um, that's one skill to just make sure, hey, is this person real or not? Should I even you know, trust that? Information is another thing that's becoming harder to know what is trustworthy and what is not. And these are skills, not only for our children, but us too, that we really, before we, Respond, react, share news, stories, information we see online. Before we do that, it would do us all a lot of good to pause and ask questions. You know, how do we know it's true? Has it been validated by another source? Um, who's actually, you know, who actually created whatever it is that I'm reading or believing? We actually work together with the National Association for Media Literacy Education on a guide for parents called A Parent's Guide to Media Literacy. And it has a bunch of scenarios where you can see a, a, a conversation between a parent and child who saw an ad or saw a news story or maybe ran across a hoax on YouTube and how they figured out whether or not it was trustworthy or not. This is probably one of the most important skills, good savvy skills that we can be teaching our children and encouraging in our homes. And they are being encouraged in schools. One of the best champions of media literacy in your children's schools are your librarians. They are heroes. You should show them your love <laughs> wherever and whenever you can. Um, but they are the resource to go to when they're working on papers, for example, and saying, should I use Wikipedia for my paper or not? Uh, what is a good source for that? And so on. Uh, I have a question for you all. Here's another question. Have you ever looked yourself up online? Tell me in the chat. Have you ever looked up your own name on a search engine? And what did you find? Turns out, um, there's a Lynette Owens in San Diego that owns a, you know, hotel conventions kind of business. There's another Lynette Owens that you can write in prison. Neither of those people are me. It's really actually important that we do this regularly and we even teach our kids to do this. If you've never asked your children, by the way, ask your kids tomorrow, have they ever looked did you ever look yourself up online and what did you find? Children have told me they've found things that actually were about them, publicly available. Thankfully, it was all stories about, oh, I, I raised money for, you know, this local shelter or I did this thing in a school play or, or something like that. And they were in the local news. So thankfully, nothing bad. Um, but there's one thing you can do so you don't have to go and actually look yourself up every time. You can set Google Alerts. Google Alerts, you go to 
um, google.com slash alerts. And you can type in any name, any word, any phrase, and it will alert you through email, weekly, daily, you can choose how often you wanna be alerted, that anytime that phrase or name or word becomes public on the internet, okay? So this is a way for you to just set it up and you don't even have to go checking yourself at the time. So one thing that um, uh, I recommend you, that that's something you could do actually after today is set up an alert on your own name or even your kids' names if you, if you want to. Um, let's see. Now, the thing about what you're gonna find when you search for yourself is it's only the information that is publicly indexable. So what does that mean? If you're posting stuff about yourself or your kids on Facebook behind privacy settings, that will not show up. If they're being posted on Instagram, TikTok, that will not be behind privacy settings, that will not show up in a Google alert. Okay, only the stuff that is public. But I wanna flip the story here for a minute. We've been following the Kaplan Institute since 2014, I think, is the first year they did this study. They started asking, your kids are young, but someday they won't be, right? And if they're interested in college or university, it's an interesting study. The question was this, beyond the application they submit, do you look the students up online to see what you find? And the first year they asked the question, 25% said yes. And the next year, 30, 35, 40. I think it got up to 45%. And then they changed the question a bit. And they said, not do you look them up, but would you? Do you think you have the right to do that? And if you did look them up, what did you find? So about two years ago, they, or three years ago, they changed the question. The most recent study came out this January. It comes out every January, okay? And these college admissions officers across the United States said, 65% said that they would definitely look up to see what they would find about these students. 58% that did look up those students said they found something that wasn't so flattering but 42%, okay, that's higher than I would have thought. 42% said they found something that made them convinced this is the student for us, okay? Why do I bring that up? Why did I connect that to Google Alerts? This is the conversation about what not to do versus what we should do. It's great if we teach our children to use these tools carefully and to protect their privacy. And you know what? You can build this wall and be completely invisible on the internet. But it would, it could be quite a benefit to them if they also can demonstrate how they have learned to use the internet in positive, productive ways. If they're a writer, maybe they have a blog. If they're a performer, Maybe there's a YouTube channel with, you know, either they're an actor, singer, musician, uh, athlete. Um, if they love to do art, maybe there's a place online that they can showcase that photography or videos or, you know, hand-drawn art, whatever it is. So I think we need to think about, as we want to protect our children from all the things they shouldn't do, what are we doing to encourage the things that they should do? like learning new skills, promoting something they care about, raising funds for a worthy organization, showcasing their accomplishments. Um, I'm a big proponent of even directing some of that online energy to contests. Why not enter a contest? Whether it's for writing or videos or performing, there's lots of great contests out there for children. And you know what? Maybe they don't win. It doesn't matter but the experience of participating in them teaches great skills about deadlines and rules and, and maybe they'll win or maybe they'll get a second prize or an honorable mention 
Those are great things to build up as part of a digital portfolio. Because someday, if they might consider a, after high school, a job or college or some other post high school endeavor, these are the things that actually could help them. Uh, on that note, I just want to plug our own contest. We run this every year in multiple countries, but in the United States, our deadline is next Tuesday, a uh, week from today. They could win $10,000, $5,000 for them and $5,000 for their school. They just have to enter a video with one answering one question. How did the internet help you get through this past year? I would love to see some of your kids or their classmates participate in our contest. The site is whatsyourstory.trimacro.com and you can find out all the rules and everything there. But based on the age of your children, I think you'll probably need to register for them as the parent and then they can submit their answer or their video. So just wrapping up here, I encourage you to stay actively involved in your children's lives. And that means communicating with them, but also um, with other parents and with others, with your school uh, community as well. And stay up to date. Um, this presentation that I've given tonight, I've been giving twice a month since last fall. And it changes every time because there are new apps, new features, new issues all the time. So I'm gonna show you my contact information at the end so you can maybe follow me on Twitter just to stay up to date on some things and some other resources too. But I challenge you all tonight or tomorrow or any time in the next week to do one new thing that you had not done before tonight. One new thing that will help support your children to become great digital citizens. I'm gonna take questions in a minute. Um, I do just want to quickly encourage you to see our resources at internetsafety.trendmicro.com. We've got tons of resources there available in 10 languages. And um, also tomorrow, uh, we actually have a, a bi-month, bi-weekly webinar series. They last 50 minutes. We have a different topic with experts every time. And tomorrow, we're actually going to be talking about the role of advertising and how we talk to our kids about our personal information and why apps are free because they're actually subsidized by advertisers and so on. So you can join us or you can go to internetsafety.trimicro.com slash webinars and see all the recordings of our past sessions. Um, finally, <clears throat> as I said earlier, when you leave tonight, there'll be a feedback form that pops up. It'll take you three, four minutes to finish. If you want to include your email address, we will put you in the running for one of five copies of Trend Micro Maximum Security, a one-year subscription, which will protect up to five devices in your home completely free. Just put, you don't have to put your email address, but if you choose to, then you might actually win one of these copies. So um, I appreciate the feedback regardless if you put your email address or not. And here is my contact information. I'd uh, love for you to follow me on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, you can email me. In fact, please email me if you would like a copy of tonight's session's recording. We'd be happy to provide that to you, but you will need to reach out to me in email so we know that you would like a copy. That um, link is going to be available for only a few weeks because we're holding another session May 11th, another one May 26th, and our information is constantly changing. So that's why the link to the recording only lasts for so long. And uh, if you have friends or family that have not attended before, we'd love to see them at a future event. So um, how hard, I'm gonna get to some questions here. Please do submit your questions in the Q&A function. Um, and uh, I think I answered the question about recording. So yes, please email me at the email address here if you would like a copy of the presentation, uh, sorry, the recording, the recording. The question is, how hard is it for kids to disable restrictions on gaming? Well, <clears throat> that depends. Um, you know, as you saw in Roblox, uh, we are done, yes, so if you don't wanna listen to the rest of the Q&A, you may leave. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, the 
settings in something like Roblox requires a code. So if you set the, the restrictions using that code, then your child will not be able to undo the restrictions unless they have your code. Okay. Now, some of the other restrictions like in, um, actually in iOS screen time, it also requires them you have to be, it has to be under your account setting it. So they're not going to be able to change it if you do it under your iTunes account. They would have to know how to get into your iTunes account in order to change it. So um, YouTube has a setting today where you can filter. You know, I told you about that new setting that's coming, but it's not available yet. YouTube has a setting called Safe Search. And you can set that so that if your child searches for adult content, it mostly filters adult pornographic content from children. It requires a Gmail account, a Google account to sign in with a password, turn on safe search in YouTube, cannot be turned off without them having your restrictions. Okay, so um, that's YouTube, not gaming necessarily. So it the answer depends on the device um, and or the actual app itself. Okay, some of them don't require that code. That's why I recommend either you use games that have those kinds of settings where you need a code or you limit the amount of time they're on the game and you're supervising that time as closely as possible. Uh, let's see, any other questions? All right. Well, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. So I um, want to thank you all again for joining me tonight. And um, please email me if you have further questions or if you'd like a copy of the presentation from tonight. Um, I'm showing this code again to all of you who need the attendance code for your school um, to let people know that you did attend tonight. So the, the code to the right of your school's name is your attendance code. Okay, and I'm gonna skip to my contact information here at the end. So if you need to contact me or would like a copy of the presentation, please email me at this address. That is it for this evening. I'd like to thank Gigi, our um, Spanish interpreter, and to all of you for spending your evening with me. Have a wonderful evening. You are great parents for being here. And um, we look forward to hopefully seeing you again next year if you host another one of these. I guarantee you there'll be new information at that time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>